virgin most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and it's great to be with you today. Uh, my name is Gary Machuda. I'm your host and sensei for the program, where we explore how to explain and defend the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. And uh, as always, we have a great show in store for you today. Uh, coming up on the other side of the break, we're going to chat with Dr. Mary Healy. You know, it's Advent. And what better subject than to go through some Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and also, you know, maybe some typology, things like that, to uh, kind of warm up the... Uh, we really haven't touched on, um, you know, uh, exercising um, our skills in the realm of Christian apologetics. So it'd be great to look at the Old Testament, see what the Old Testament has to say about the coming Messiah and how Jesus fulfills those prophecies that's going to be coming on the other side of the break it'll be a lot of fun uh this is the first time dr healy is coming into the dojo so we'll give her a well a very warm warm welcome um also our critical thinking skills our finding the fallacy for today is the appeal to authority and also we're going to meet an early church father his name is theodoret of sire Theodort of Sire, and uh, it's time for me to give my shout-outs to welcome all those watching on social media, Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everyone. Great to see familiar names. It's great to be back in the dojo with you guys, and also it's great to be with you listening on Catholic radio stations around the country and also abroad. Welcome aboard, everybody. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so why don't I just jump right into the Finding the Fallacy uh, the finding the fallacy for today is the appeal to, uh, to authority. Now, this is one of those fallacies where there's an awful lot of confusion as to what is meant by it. I've seen on the Internet definitions where basically any kind of appeal to any authority was seen as fallacious. But I, I don't think that's the proper definition. So um, if I could, let me give you uh, my uh understanding of the fallacy and of course i'm open to correction but uh the appeal to authority um is an appeal to authority uh that invalidates arguments in other words it is perfectly reasonable to appeal to experts within a field of their expertise um, in other words if you're talking about physics uh it's perfectly legitimate for you to appeal to a th an authority who is an expert in physics, especially that particular area of physics that is at hand. Where the fallacy comes in is where you appeal to authority of somebody who is speaking outside of the realm of expertise. And I think that's really the true definition of the fallacy of the appeal to authority. For example, you know, appealing to Albert Einstein in regards to uh, his theology or our elements of theology, really, Albert Einstein really has as much competence as pretty much anybody else. But if you were going to uh, talk about the theory of relativity, then uh, absolutely, Albert Einstein would be proper to cite as an authority. And this occurs a lot. Um, for example, uh, you, you see this a lot in atheistic apologetics where uh, people are cited uh, that are experts in science, but really what they're talking about f belongs in the realm of philosophy. And so since it's outside of their expertise, they really have no special competence in that area. Unless, of course, they've done a lot of study and, you know, are trained in that area to speak in terms of philosophy. So it would be an, an appeal to authority for you to appeal to someone who's speaking on things that are not relevant to the topic. I think that's really the gist of it, folks, and it really comes down to that. So that's our finding in the fallacy for today, the appeal to authority. 
Let's move on to our Meet the Early Church Fathers segment, which is Theodoret of Sire, who was born roughly A.D. 393, died sometime around 466, just to give you an idea of where we're talking about in church history. Um, And this is quite long and involved, so that's why I wanted to jump right in, because I'm not sure if I could actually (laughs) complete all the bio on this. But anyway, uh, Theodoret was born in Antioch about the year 393, as we said, and in 423. When he was about 30 years of age, he was somewhat against his will made Bishop of Sire, a small town in Syria, about a Tuesday, two-day journey away from Antioch. And uh, as our source, Jurgen's Faith of the Early Fathers, points out rather humorously, that's two days by donkey, folks. That's not by automobile. Um, there he governed his diocese very capably for the next 40 years. Uh, statements to the effect that Theodore was a fellow student of Nestorius, well-known heretic Nestorius, and also John of Antioch, under the tutelage of another suspect early church father, Theodore of Mopsuestia. It, uh, Jurgen says it may very well be true, but it rests on very little and real evidence. Uh, but nevertheless, he was a product of the Antiochian school of theology, and was indeed at the, its last and perhaps greatest of theologians to come out of that school. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what is Antiochian school of theology? Well, uh, think of it as the opposite of Alexandrian school of theology. Alexandrian school looked at scriptures and gave the spiritual sense of scripture its primary focus. The Antiochian school gave the literal sense of scripture as its primary focus. And actually, of the two schools, um, the Antiochian school had a lot of problems, actually a lot more problems than the uh, um, Alexandrian school. But nevertheless, uh, Theodore was a man of firm principle and great moral rectitude. And although the so-called creed of union that Cyril accepted in 433 was probably composed by Theodore himself in the autumn of 432, Theodore refused to accept the union of Cyril and the Eastern bishops under its original terms and finally joined in only when the demand for the formal recognition of the condemnation of Nestorius was dropped. Um, now, around this time, Theodore you know, was mixed up in this uh, uh, problems in terms of uh, the Apollon- uh, Apollonius uh, heresy. Now starts getting mixed up in what's known as the Monophysite heresy. Uh, he soon engaged in the struggle with the Monophysites. A heretic, uh, this is the heretic who started this, by the way, is Eutyches. And what's interesting, although uh, he was very warm towards Nestorian, uh, the Monophysites were the opposite. Nestorian believed that Jesus had, Jesus's two natures were so separate, the divine and human nature, that he almost ends up being two persons, the Monophysites were the opposite. They claimed that Jesus only had one nature, a kind of mixture of the divine and human nature. So Theodoret, uh, you know, uh, begins to address that heresy. Uh, he succeeded in Alexandria by a Dioscorsus, and uh, Dioscorsus um, was Monophysite. So um, at the Synod of Ephesus in 449, Dioscorsus, Dioscorus succeeded in deposing Theodoret and forced him into exile. Theodoret appealed to Pope Leo I, and Leo declared that the proceedings of Ephesus in 449 was null and void. In fact, that is where Pope Leo calls this council by something that we still use today. It's known as the Robber Synod, or the Robber Council. Um, The Emperor um, Marcian Return Theodore to Sire in 450. And again, we find Theodore again appearing at the Council of Chalcedon in uh, 451. Uh, however, it, apparently they were very reluctant to have him sit at the council. Uh, only when he agreed to anathematize Nestorius and, quote, all those who do not confess that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the Mother of God, and who divide into two the only son, the only begotten. Um, Only then was he allowed to sit at the council, because there were suspicions about his favoritism towards Nestorius. And um, with that, he was formally reinstated 
in that council to, as Bishop of Sire, and he is recognized by the Fathers of Chalcedon as an Orthodox teacher. So uh, Theodore had an excellent knowledge of the classical Greek authors. And what's interesting is, you know, he comes from Syria. So his mother tongue is Syriac, but he actually writes excellent Greek in a very excellent, simple style. And in fact, uh, all of his writings, I believe, that we have from Theodore uh, come to us in Greek. Uh, finally, you know, sometime around 450 AD, He's estimated that he has written roughly about 35 books, if you can imagine that, although a large portion of those books are now lost. So in that sense, he's very much like many of the early church fathers. For example, Origin of Alexandria. I forgot how many books he wrote, but it's upwards of 30, um, a, lot, a lot more upwards than 30. But, uh, you know, we only have a handful of his books that survive today. Unfortunately, that's also true with Theodore of Sire, who is, by the way, our Meet the Early Church Father for today, Theodore of Sire. So, uh, yeah, I was able to get through this text. There's a lot of complicated history. Uh, you can uh, read more of them on, for example, the Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, that's, by the way, a source that I use a lot, and I probably should pass it around as kind of an apologetics hack for you guys if you want to get a hold of the old, not the new one. Not the, um, the the later version. I think it came out originally in the 60s or 70s. But the old 19, I think it's 06 edition, you can access it free online on a number of sites. But one site that I prefer is the newadvent.org site. And just look it up and you can read more about Theodore and his complex history. All right, here's the music. Coming up next, we're going to be talking with Dr. Mary Healy. About Old Testament prophecies and foreshadowings of Jesus. Don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, In her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church, to aid and defend her. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody, to Hands On Apologetics. And, you know, Christmas is coming, and the Messiah is born, the hope of Israel. But where do we get that hope for the Messiah? How do we know about the Messiah? Where is the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures? Well, to help us uh, kind of uncover the Old Testament messianic uh, prophecies and foreshadowings, we have none other than Dr. Mary Healy. Dr. Healy is the professor of sacred scripture at Sacred Heart Major Seminary here in Detroit and an international speaker on topics related to scripture, evangelism, healing, and spiritual life. She's the general editor of the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture and the author of two of its volumes on the Gospel of Mark and Hebrews. And you can find out all the great stuff that Dr. Healy has done and written at her website, which is www.drmaryhealy.com, drmaryhealy.com. But just abbreviate that, and it's all one word, drmaryhealy.com. And Dr. Healy, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you. It's great to be with you. You know, right before the show, I wanted to get an updated bio of you. And we've met a few times in the past. I don't know if you remember. I'm, I'm hard to forget because I'm so tall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I've been following you. I love your commentaries on Mark and Hebrews. I, I've you. used them a lot. But I went to your site. I didn't realize you've been very busy. There's some fantastic books that you've read. I, I would love to. S- busy. <laughs> yes, I, I I would love to have you sometime on to talk about healing. Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, very good. So, um, yeah, keep up the good work. This is fantastic. Uh, so let's talk you. about you Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it's always a good time to talk about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, Christmas is coming, uh, and of course, you know, Jesus is the hope of Israel. But where did the Israelites get the hope for the coming Messiah? What, what text would we go to? Well, there are so many. And, of course, when I think of the Jewish people hoping and waiting and longing for the Messiah, I, I can't help but think of the greatest Bible study ever given, which is Jesus' conversation with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Mm, okay. And you know that story from Luke 24 when right. it says... He interpreted for them all the things in the scriptures concerning himself, in the law and the prophets, and in the writings. And, and that, that walk was um, most likely an 18-mile walk. So just imagine hours and hours on the road with Jesus as he points them to all the scriptures that, that pointed to or foreshadowed himself. And, and I just imagine... Cleopas, the, the disciple, and, and his friend saying, wow, oh my gosh, I, I, never, I never saw that. Yes, I see now, I get it, wow. <laughs> and that, that should be our experience, too, as we read the Old Testament, all of it written long before the coming of Jesus, and we realize that God had already planned out everything beforehand, and he had already given hints prophecies, foreshadowings, types and figures, and in a, in a multitude of different ways, he had prepared his people for the coming of his son. Wow, that's so, beautiful. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe the, the, the best place to start is the very first Messianic prophecy. I think most people would recognize at this uh, verse as such. It's Genesis 3.15, and mm-hmm. it's right after the fall of Adam and Eve, and they have just disobeyed God and, and, and inaugurated the whole horrible, tragic history of human sin and all the effects of sin. And in the midst of this kind of unfolding disaster, God suddenly kind of, um, he, he kind of slips in a word of prophecy in, in his, his condemnation of the serpent. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he will crush your head. You will crush his heel, meaning you will you will deal the seed of the woman a blow, but but the seed of the woman is going to deal you a fatal blow. Hmm. And so this this tragedy that you have launched by by tempting and seducing Adam and Eve, it's all going to be undone. There's going to be a seed of the woman who will come 
and and will bring a reversal of this uh, original sin and everything that that came with it. So, of course, looking in hindsight now, we can see the the woman is fulfilled in the new Eve, Mary, and it's her seed who is the Messiah, who has definitively once and for all crushed the head of the serpent, defeated Satan by his death on the cross. Yeah. So that's a, the very first Messianic prophecy. And, and, and what, you, you, what you might notice here and with many of the prophecies in the Old Testament is that they're not given in a very precise, detailed way. That's not the way God gives prophecy. He doesn't give a uh, you know, full-color, uh, completely mapped out timeline with details, with everything exactly as it's going to be, so that we can uh, predict everything to a T beforehand. Instead, he gives, um, he gives like brush strokes, or, or you could say it's, it's like a sketch, or it's like a, um, a, a black and white uh, image and it's only when the reality happens that we can look back at the prophecy and say, oh, that's what it meant. <laughs> only when the reality happens do we see the full color picture. Yeah. So a prophecy, is, is, it's always kind of like a silhouette. It's not the full 3D full color picture. And, and God just designed it that way because he, he didn't want us to have a full picture beforehand. He only wanted us to be able to, to see once he has accomplished his word, he wants us to be able to look back and see, oh, God said it was going to be like that. And now I understand what he prophesied. Yes. No, yeah, very good. So, there are... so in a sense, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, it's uh, exactly. you really don't realize things are as they are until after it occurs. Yes, that's right. It's, it's hindsight is twenty twenty, and and the prophecies beforehand are they, there's a certain um, shadowiness to them. Yeah. But on the other hand, there are some that are very specific. Um, for example, one of the famous verses that we read during Advent is from Micah, which prophesies that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. O oh, you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule, to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. So, in other words, God is saying in that prophecy, which is more than 700 years before the time of Christ, that a great ruler will come from the village of Bethlehem, but will also be one who is, in a mysterious way, from ancient days. So it's, it's hinting at the fact that the Messiah will not be a mere man who is born in time, that he will in some way be eternal. And again, in the New Testament, we, we see the, the full depth of that statement, that Christ is the eternal Son of the Father. Wow. But it's yeah. a very specific detail given by the prophet Micah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, I, I focus usually is on the, the prophecy about Bethlehem, you know, because that's where Herod, you know, inquires with the uh, the scribes. But yeah, it also prophesies uh, his preexistence. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And then uh, another one, um, very famous, is in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And this one is interesting because most scholars will say that if you if you in, if you translate the original Hebrew exactly, it says, "Behold, the young woman will conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel." Now Isaiah says that to King Ahaz, and if you read that original Hebrew, it sounds like a nice sign, but nothing miraculous. A young woman will conceive and bear a son. Okay, that happens every day. Mm -hmm. But when the Old Testament scriptures were translated into Greek, which happened more than two centuries before Christ, in that sentence, they translated it this way. Behold, the virgin 
shall conceive and bear a son. And that's saying something miraculous. That's saying something that does not happen every day. God is saying, I'm going to give you a stupendous sign. A virgin is going to conceive and bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So already in the, in the Greek translation of the prophet Isaiah, again, two centuries before Christ, there was a recognition that this promise is not just talking about an ordinary everyday thing as a sign, a young woman conceiving. No, it's talking about a miracle. And, and somehow God is going to give the sign of a virgin bearing a son who is in a mysterious way going to be Emmanuel, God with us. So it's an example of how a prophecy actually, it grew in depth over time. As, as the Jewish people meditated on it and reflected on it, they, they came to a, a recognition of a miraculous dimension to it that may not have been in there in the original, but the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to, to have that hope in, in this great miracle that God was going to make a virgin give birth. Mm-hmm. And that becomes one of the, the greatest Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus, born as a Virgin Mary. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, th- it, that's an uh, excellent point, too, is that you have the text, but you also have to have the interpretation of the text. And Yes, uh, exactly. It, yeah, so it's it's, you know, through God's providence... You know, he shapes the history of Israel so that the interpretations of these texts kind of bring out, you know, meaning that's implicit there, but makes it explicit. Mm-hmm. 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 Exactly. And then yeah, there's, there's a whole other kind of prophecy that is actually not literally a prophecy, but what's called typology. And what that means is that events in the history of Israel or historical people and things and institutions were themselves a kind of prophecy in act. In other words, it it wasn't a a specific prophetic word, God is going to do this or this is going to happen, but certain events pointed forward by the very way they occurred. They pointed forward to the fulfillment of God's plan. So one, one great example of that is... Well, actually, Dr. Healy, uh, I, I hear the music coming up, so I, I don't want you to give the text before the break. Okay. This is actually a great cliffhanger before the commercial. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. We're chatting with Dr. Mary Healy about Old Testament prophecies and foreshadowings about Jesus. Stay tuned, folks, because uh, we're going to learn a little bit about typology on the other side of the break. Listen to Hands-On Apologetics. Stay tuned. We have an exciting story for you to listen to, the story of John Pridmore. John Pridmore was a hitman for the gangs in East London. I met some guys who seemed to have everything that I thought would make you happy. So I started working for these people, so to my shame I was involved in vicious crime of all sorts. He collected debts for the gangs, and if people didn't pay their debts, it was his job to kill them. And as I drove home that night, I thought, what have I become that I could kill someone and not even care? He was in the elevator on his way up to the 17th floor, and there was a 17-year-old young man in the elevator with him. Suddenly, this young man looked John right in the eye, and he said, Jesus loves you. And I said the first prayer I'd ever said. I said, up to now, all I've done is take from you, God. Now I want to give. Within a year, by the grace of God, John was able to get out of the gang and be freed from this road to hell that he had been walking on. Go to Virgin Most Powerful YouTube channel and listen to this story today. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, 
A portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We are chatting with Dr. Mary Healy about Old Testament prophecies of Christ. And right before the break, Dr. Healy gave a great explanation about typology, how in God's uh, providence he shapes certain people, institutions, things in the Old Testament that foreshadows something that's going to be fulfilled in the new. And uh, Dr. Healy, I'm sorry I had to jump in, but I didn't want you to jump into the text before the commercial. So, uh, (laughs) Sure. Well, um, there are some amazing examples of typology in in the books of Genesis and Exodus especially. Um, First of all, in in Genesis 22, we have this very mysterious story where God asks Abram, to offer up his only son in sacrifice. And, and this is the son that, that Abraham loves, that he has waited for for so many long years, that God promised to him, even though he, was, he and his wife were infertile. And God finally fulfilled the promise, and all, God, all Abraham's hopes are kind of centered in this child. And God says, offer him up to me. Hmm. And, and Abraham willingly does that, and he, he walks with Isaac, his son, to the place of sacrifice, and Isaac cooperates in, in this sacrifice. Somehow he, he knows what's going to happen, and according to tradition, he's probably a, a, a teenage boy or young man at that point. He makes no struggle. He could have overpowered his father. He could have escaped. He, instead, he willingly agrees to be offered up. And then as they're going to the place of sacrifice, what does Isaac carry? The wood. Hmm. So how could we not see a foreshadowing of Christ carrying the wood of his own cross, carrying the cross beam to the place of execution? Hmm. And then um, they get to the place where Abraham is going to offer him up, and and he, he reaches out with the knife to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord stops him, And says, the Lord will provide a ram himself. Now, it's really interesting because the actual word order is the Lord will provide himself the lamb. The Lord will provide himself the lamb. In other words, God will not ask this sacrifice of Abraham. God will not ask him to give up his only beloved son. It's God himself who will provide the lamb who is the ultimate sacrifice that atones for all sin ever committed in all history. God's own beloved son. And he will be the true lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So in a way, far beyond what Abraham could have understood at that point, Mm -hmm. God does provide himself his own beloved son, as, as the lamb of sacrifice. Wow. So that's, that's an amazing um, prefigurement of Christ. Then um, there's, there's one of a different kind in the book of Exodus, because here you see the whole nation of Israel, God's people. They have just been born, basically, as a nation. They have, they have grown into a multitude of people, And they went down to Egypt because of famine. And then God is going to take them out of Egypt, rescue them from slavery in Egypt by means of crossing through water, passing through the water of the Red Sea. So, in other words, 
the Lord, for his own purposes, has his people in their in their toddler years as a nation. He has them in Egypt, and then he brings them out of Egypt to the Holy Land. Well, fast forward to the New Testament. God sends his own beloved son, and Jesus, too, like his people, spends his toddler years in Egypt. And also like Israel, just as there was a a murderous king in Egypt, the Pharaoh, who tried to kill the Israelites by uh, having all their male babies killed, so there's a murderous king at the time of Jesus' birth who kills all the male babies in the vicinity of Bethlehem. So Jesus, just like Moses, escapes from a wicked ruler. And then just as God leads Moses and the people of Israel out of Egypt back to the promised land, so Jesus too goes out of Egypt and back to the promised land. And then the fact that God does it through water, well, that foreshadows not only Christ himself, but in, in, a, um, in a more indirect way, us as disciples of Jesus, as members of the church, how are we saved from slavery, the slavery to sin, through water, but in our case, the water of baptism? So just like ancient Israel was was rescued from slavery, passed through the Red Sea into the Promised Land, so we are rescued from slavery to sin. We pass through the water of baptism on our way to the Promised Land, which is heaven, the kingdom of God. So many, many, many layers of typology and foreshadowing there. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, just as you were saying that, I was thinking... Yeah, and the Israelites were tempted in the desert, and Jesus is tempted in the desert as well. Yes, exactly. So Jesus has his 40 days in the desert, just as Israel had their 40 years in the desert. And just as Israel is tested, and um, of course they don't pass the test, they continually grumble and gripe and mumble and moan and complain and rebel against God. Jesus, in this case, he does the opposite. He... Mm -hmm. In, in a very real way, Jesus becomes the true Israelite. He becomes the faithful son that God always wanted Israel to be. He responds to God through all the testing of his time in the desert and his whole life. With, he responds with perfect obedience and trust in the Father. So Jesus relives the history of Israel in a mysterious way, but in, in a perfect key, in the key of the faithful, obedient son that God always wanted his people to be. Yes. Yeah, very good. You know, you know and I often think, you know, if, you, if I was an apostle or a disciple at that time, I probably wouldn't put all that together. It would only be after, you know, Christ ascended that I would think, wow, you know, Christ's life is a lot like Israel, you know. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure that's true. I, I'm sure that it was only years of reflection and, and meditating on all these things that that they saw more and more. I don't think they, they got that knowledge all at once. Yeah. Um, another example of that is when Jesus cleansed the temple. Mm -hmm. You remember he went into the temple with his disciples, and he, he uh, became very angry at the commercialization and the corruption of God's house. And he began to drive out the money changers and to spill over their tables and to drive out the animals that were being bought and sold. And his disciples were confused and astounded and had no idea what he was doing. But the gospel says, the gospel of John says, afterward they remembered the scripture that says, zeal for your house will consume me. So it was only afterward that as they pondered all of the things Jesus had said and done in his earthly life, and they read it against the background of the Old Testament, that they said, oh, that's what that meant. That's why he did that. Now I get it. And the amazing thing is that even 2,000 years later, we're still having those aha moments. And and scholars and saints and ordinary people are still seeing insights in the scripture and things that Jesus fulfilled that nobody has seen before. We're still yeah. finding new things. There's always more. 
yeah, that's just astounding. You know, the inspiration of scripture. And like you said, you just don't yeah, never yeah. plumb the depths. Every time you read it, you discover something new in it, something that's yeah. life changing that you can apply to today. You know, it's not just a right, factoid right. from the past. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's alive. It's truly alive. And, and here's another um, amazing example of typology. It's one of my favorites. And this one is interesting because it's not really mentioned in the New Testament. But looking back on the Old Testament in the light of Christ, you, again, you say, wow, <laughs> wow, look at all the ways this points to him. And this is the story of Joseph at the end of the, the book of Genesis. It's, it's the last 13 chapters or so of the book of Genesis. And if you look at all the details of Joseph and just, just think, think ahead to the New Testament, it's so interesting because you see a son who is beloved by his father, but envied by his brothers. Jesus was envied by the Jewish leaders. A man who foretold his future glory. Joseph had all these dreams of his glory. He was sent out for, by his father, and he looked for his brothers until he found them. Just what Christ did. did. Hmm. He was conspired against and betrayed by his brothers. He was stripped of his robe. His brothers stripped off his robe and cast him down. And he was sold for pieces of silver. If you, if you know the Gospels, all this sounds really familiar, right? Yeah. Uh, Joseph was 30 years old when he began his life's work. That <laughs> sounds familiar too, right? <laughs> yeah. He, he became a servant. He was tempted. In his case, he was tempted by the wife of his Egyptian master, Potiphar. But he did not sin. He was falsely accused. Mm -hmm. He foretold the future. And finally, he was raised to high honor and forgave his brothers. And he gave bread to a famished world. If that doesn't point to Jesus, I don't know what does. <laughs> wow. I have never seen those connections bread. before. Wow, yeah, that's that beautiful. Amazing? Yeah, so he's released from prison and given high office. Yeah, yeah. just like yeah. Uh, the, where he preached in the souls in prison. Raised wow. from the gra grave, given, given high office and provides the true bread, the bread from heaven yeah. to a starving world. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. And and folks that you know that's called typology right i mean all exactly. that is implicit in the story but it's when christ comes that you can look back and say wow look at these connections that joseph foreshadows jesus yeah and, and again it's not explicit it doesn't say um this is what will happen to the messiah the messiah will be 30 years old when he begins his public ministry he will be sold for pieces of silver it doesn't it doesn't say that Right. It's, it's only when you read the story and you see this is the history of Joseph. Oh, God meant it as a shining light to point forward to the greater Savior, his own beloved Savior. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies, featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Karstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14, 2020, at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today for Adoramus at the Triduum. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Male and female he created them. According to Pope St. John the Twenty-Third, 
It is not true that some human beings are by nature superior and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in His image and likeness and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. We are chatting with Dr. Mary Healy about prophecies and foreshadowings of Christ in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, Dr. Healy, you, you helped clarify something that uh, on the road to Emmaus after the 18-mile journey, you know, the disciples probably would have said, Lord, stop, You're, my head hurts. But instead they say, stay with <laughs> us. I want to hear more. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. And isn't that, isn't that beautiful that the Lord waits for an invitation? He doesn't yes. force himself on anybody. He's, he's waiting to be invited by us. And he hopes that each one of us will, sit, will say, like Cleopas and his friend, Lord, stay with us. Lord, come in. And, and share a meal with us. I, I want to, I want to come to know you better. And of course, yeah. after coming to know Jesus in breaking open His Word, they come to know Him in the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, boy, the, what a wonderful typology with uh, with Joseph. Um, and uh, let me ask you a question now. Sometimes Christ will refer to passages that aren't messianic. For example, mm -hmm. uh, he quotes with Judas, I think it's in the Gospel of John, uh, uh, that the, the one who sits at my table raised his heel against us. But if you look at that mm -hmm. context, David is talking, he actually confesses he sins. So obviously, you know, it, it wouldn't be a messianic prophecy of the Messiah's sinning, right? Uh, you mean of the uh, the betrayer sinning against him? Well, if you read the context of that, you know, earlier in that psalm, he t he confesses his yeah. sin. So obviously the whole psalm can't be messianic, or can it? Oh, right, exactly. Right. Sometimes um, we, we have to take a, a passage not um, not seeing the, the entire context with all its details as applying in the same way to Christ, mm -hmm. but a, a piece of it or a part of it that shines a particularly bright light on Christ and on his paschal ministry. So, um, yeah. yes, wherever you see a psalm talking about, um, you know, my sin and uh, re repentance for sin and uh, my guilt, um, how could that point to Christ? Well, it points to Christ in the sense that he takes on our sin. Yeah. He himself is without sin. And yet he totally identifies with sinful humanity. And he pays the price, in fact, for all of our sin. So in that, in that psalm where um, the, the psalmist says, this is Psalm 41, the psalmist says, I have sinned against you. Heal me for I have sinned against you. And then he, he goes on saying, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted my heel against me. It, it's talking about the, the anguish of somebody who recognizes his sinfulness and and recognizes the negative consequences of living in, in the fallen world and and Jesus by quoting that that one verse is saying i i share the anguish of human beings who live in the fallen world i share that sense of um uh, sorrow and profound pain that a close friend has turned against me and betrayed me. So I think that's the best way to to read a, a psalm like that. 
Yeah, and and that good. psalm, of course, um, it, it brings up the the many biblical passages that prophesy or foreshadow the passion of Christ. And mm-hmm. this is one of those things that Christians can sometimes um, we can sometimes have an attitude of smugness, saying, "Gosh, how could the Jews not have recognized that the Messiah was going to suffer?" Because right. there's so many passages that point to the suffering of the Messiah. Right, but. Actually, when you read them without having the full knowledge of Christ, it's not as clear because, again, God does not give all the details in exactly the order in which and in the way they're going to occur. It's only once Christ came that we we look upon the whole mystery of, of what he did for us with the help of the Holy Spirit, and we say, oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. It did the scriptures did say the Messiah would suffer. Like one one clear example is in the prophet Amos, one of the earliest prophets, who uh where God said in Amos that he would make the sun go down in uh at noon. He would make darkness come over the land at noon and there would be a morning as if for an only sun. Hmm. What happens on Good Friday? The sun is darkened at noon at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, and there is an only son who who dies and is mourned. So that's a very clear prophecy of the Passion. And then uh, Psalm 22 is um, the the psalm that most amazingly points forward to the Passion of Christ. It's the one that Jesus himself quotes from the cross um, when he says, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? He's quoting from the first verse of Psalm 22. Um, but the psalm goes on to describe the torments of of this person who is in anguish and being attacked by his enemies. And then at one point it says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to get that more, it's hard to get more specific than that regarding the details of how Christ endured his crucifixion, his hands and his feet pierced. Yes. And then um, and then you have the prophecies of Isaiah, and really of all the prophets, Isaiah is the one who by far uh, pointed forward the most to Christ. He's sometimes called the prophet of the Messiah, because he not only prophesied his, his virgin birth and other details of his birth, but he prophesied so much about Christ's passion, especially in Isaiah chapter 53. And and that's the famous fourth suffering servant song about a a mysterious um, servant of God who is um, despised and rejected by men, acquainted with grief, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And then it goes on and says, He opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And that's exactly what Jesus did in his trial before Pilate. He, he was silent. He, he didn't defend himself. And it goes on and, and, and speaks about how he, he was buried with a rich man in the grave of a rich man. And that, too, is a, a detail that corresponds to the Passion. Yeah. So, you know, re- we read the, that beautiful fourth Suffering Servant song during uh, Passion Week in Good Friday because it so amazingly points forward to the details of Christ's death. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, and, if, and it continues, and it talks about the resurrection, too, that he will see yes, light. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the, it, it it says, um, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. He shall make many to be accounted righteous. Um, he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death. So all of that is speaking about the Lord raising him up, vindicating him, rescuing him from death. So it's pointing in a veiled way, not a directly, but in a veiled way to his resurrection. Yes. Yeah. In fact, that's one of those things where in the New Testament, 
you know, he says, don't you know that the Messiah must suffer and rise again on the third day? And you're, and it's like, yeah. I don't remember the Messiah being prophesied <laughs> that he'll rise. But, you know, there in Isaiah, yeah. you yeah. do get this. He dies, and yet, you know, he'll see offspring. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and the three days um, probably refers to a verse in Hosea, where Hosea um, is, well, God is actually teaching his people how to cry out to him. And and they say, on the third day, he will raise us up. On the mm-hmm. third day, he will raise us up. So um, that seems to be the whole nation rising up. But yeah. what truly happens in the resurrection of Christ? His resurrection is not for him alone. It's the resurrection of humanity, of the whole people of yeah. God, all who believe in him. So truly, on the third day, when Christ was raised all of us have been raised up in him. Hmm. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. It, you know, that reminds me of what Augustine says that Christ, there's one Christ head and body and that sometimes in prophecy, it refers to Christ as head and sometimes as Christ as body and sometimes both. Exactly. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's a beautiful, clear um, distinction of, of Augustine. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, well, uh, it's unbelievable, but our hour has flown. <laughs> it was so much fun talking about Scripture. And we, the surface. I know. I was just literally going to say that. <laughs> I, there's so much more we could get into. Uh, well, before we go, again, how, we, uh, how can people get a hold of you and your work, maybe invite you to come talk at their parish or get a hold oh, of your thank books? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, my website is drmaryhealy.com. That's all one word for Dr. Mary Healy, drmaryhealy.com. And my books are there. Um, a lot of my books you could also get in a Catholic bookstore or online uh, websites. And, um, yeah, I have a pretty busy schedule, but I, I do come to parishes <laughs> when I can. And I, I love doing that. I love part, part of my mission is to help Catholics fall in love with the Word of God. And to, yeah, to have a thirst to study Scripture and to get to know it better. And you do a fantastic job. One last question. Uh, any more commentaries uh, coming out, or is that uh, well, just Well, as two? a matter of fact, um, now that we've completed the whole New Testament commentary series, um, the last one just came out last month, or a couple months ago, we are now starting on the Old Testament, and I'm working oh. on Genesis. Awesome. Which is a big problem. Oh, that's great. I'm I'm writing a commentary on the book of Genesis. Which is a long, long book. <laughs> yes, it is. Sure. I know. <laughs> and I'm rich. As compact as I can. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Incredibly rich. Yes, there is gold in them, our hills. Well, thank you so much oh, for coming you. on the show. We appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that. Advent. Oh, yes, you too. You too. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Dr. Mary Healy. And again, uh, she has some great books, some excellent commentaries on sacred scripture. Uh, You can find all about uh, the book she wrote and also her speaking engagements and other material. www.drmaryhealy, all one word, dot com. And, uh, you know, avail yourselves of it because she does magnificent work. And, uh, Boy, like I said, it's the fastest hour on Catholic Talk Radio. We are already done. But the fun continues with high-impact Catholic Talk with the dynamic duo of Terry Barber and Jesse Romero. It's Terry and Jesse show. And it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center here, turn off the dojo lights. I want to thank everybody for listening to the program. Truly, truly appreciate it. And God willing, we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye, everybody. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. 
I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.